So I want to start out by giving you guys an example of an organism that is not only able to survive on this planet, but because of the adaptations it has, is able to thrive on it. Take a look at the scorpion. The scorpion can be found in forest, mountain, and desert ecosystems on all continents except for Antarctica. But perhaps most impressive is its mastery of the desert ecosystem, a place where water is scarce. The reason it's able to do this is because most of the water a desert scorpion needs to survive, it gets from the prey it consumes, which is primarily small insects. Now, scorpions have the unique ability to slow down their metabolism to one third the rate of a typical arthropod, making it possible for them to survive on as few as one to two insects a year. Now, as a grad student, I could only imagine how much money I could save per month on groceries <laughs> if I could do that. You see, with all the beautiful organisms and all the brilliant adaptations you can find on this planet, it's no wonder why we, as a human civilization, have the tendency to look towards nature to be the muse of our inspirations and designs. An example of this is during the Renaissance in the works of Leonardo da Vinci, one of my personal favorites. Leonardo wasn't only a brilliant painter, but he was also actively engaged in the sciences and engineering. He became especially interested in developing a contraption that would allow for human-driven flight. And in order to achieve this, looked towards the biomechanics of birds and bats and the way they flew. You see, Leonardo, he was a firm believer in the fact that we could learn from nature, going so far as to claim that those who are inspired by a model other than nature, a mistress above all masters, are laboring in vain. Fast forward to the turn of the 19th century, in scientific advancements such as microscopy, botany, the development of cell theory, and the theory of evolution revolutionized the way artists looked at the world and allowed them to create works of art that showed the artistic side of biology in a movement that was to be called the Art Nouveau movement. But you see, artists weren't the only ones that were inspired by the beauty of nature. Biologists also began to take an aesthetic approach to the way that they communicated their research. Ernst Haeckel was a biologist who not only made significant advancements in the field of evolutionary biology, but he was also well known for his artistic representations of the organisms he studied, like the ones that you see here, which are the illustrations he made of sea-dwelling organisms called radiolaria. So as you can see, history is full of examples of us learning and being inspired by nature. But there are still a lot of differences in the way we design things and the way things in nature tend to operate. You see, we as humans right now only tend to look to nature to be the source of innovation to exploit, when doing so has caused devastating effects to our planet. Things such as deforestation, overhunting, and carbon emissions are at an all-time high. And that's what brings me to what I'm here to talk to you tonight, which is biomimicry. Biomimicry is a design philosophy which urges us not to only look to nature as a source for innovation, but also sustainability by mimicking solutions we can find in nature that are the output of billions of years of natural selection and trial and error. Solutions that have allowed organisms to live harmoniously with one another on this planet. So, we as biomedic designers, we can approach this in different ways and at different scales. We can mimic form. Forms in nature and hierarchical structuring of materials often result in high strength to weight ratios. But forms in nature do more than just provide strong structural support. And we don't have to look at just the macro scale, but we can look at the micro. Take a look at the gecko toe pad. Geckos are able to adhere to surfaces because of small, tiny, hair-like structures called CD, which are one-tenth of the diameter of our own human hairs. And just like our human hairs can have split ends, these CD can branch off into even smaller structures called spatulae. Now, the incredibly small scale of these spatulae allows it to come into very close contact with surfaces and allows for adhesion intermolecular forces called van der Waals forces. 
Now, individually, these forces aren't too strong. But when you multiply these structures and these forces by the billions that are on these gecko toe pads, that's what allows the geckos to stick. So here at the University of Akron, in an interdisciplinary effort between polymer scientists, biologists, and designers, we're looking to better understand this adhesion system and look into ways environmental factors such as water impact the system in the hopes that we can contribute to the development of synthetic adhesion systems and they can be perform under the same conditions. And this is just form. We can also mimic entire systems in nature. Systems in nature tend to be closed loop, meaning that all or most of the waste energy produced by one component can be reused by another component of the ecosystem. Trees are a great example of this, as they are some of the key actors of maintaining the water and oxygen cycle. But for us designers, emulating natural systems is especially difficult because where industrial systems have well-defined components with well-defined functions, systems in nature are far from simple. Modifying and changing one component can have drastic and unexpected changes to another part. But being able to do so may allow for the development of entire urban landscapes in which buildings work harmoniously with one another. The waste energy produced by one building can be reused by another, minimizing the amount of energy that leaves the system. So these are just a couple of the scales that we work on. And because of technological advancements, the methods and the applications in which we do design are just as amazing. And they are, for, and they are allowing new kinds of biomimicry. Take, for instance, generative design. Generative design is a method in which designers not only work with the use of, but in collaboration with computers. Designs are the output of algorithms and parameters and constraints given by the designer to the computer run through optimization programs to acquire some sort of desired aesthetic or function. The output of this can be beautiful organic form like the one that you see here. In a collaboration between Cecilia Sanella, Claudio Granado, and Dino Kiratsidis, this conceptual design is for a bridge to be placed over a river in Vienna that provides not only a pleasing aesthetic, but also a practical function. So where does biomimicry fit into all this? Well, if we were to use biological algorithms and parameters and constraints that we can find in nature, such as the abalone shell, which promotes strong structural support, or a kingfisher beak, which promotes more efficient streamlining in air and water, the result could be more efficient and more sustainable designs. Another high-tech example is in the field of robotics. Nature is home to some of the most efficient, but also some of the most complex mechanics. So researchers are looking into the biomechanics of nature in order to develop bio-inspired robots that do some pretty amazing things. For example, it's completely possible that one day, robot cockroaches may actually save your life which I know sounds a little crazy, so let me explain. You see, cockroaches, and don't worry, this guy, he's not being harmed in the least bit. And that's what makes this so amazing. Cockroaches have the unique ability to compress their body size to fit into tight places. So what researchers at the University of California and Berkeley are doing is they've developed cockroach-inspired robots that are able to compress their body size by 50%. This could have great uses for things such as disaster search and rescue by testing rubble stability and locating survivors. So maybe be not so crazy. You see, what these examples show us is that technological advancement and innovation doesn't necessarily have to bring about the destruction of our planet with it. We can use very new and cutting edge technology to mimic very old but very efficient biological solutions. But the question I've been asking myself, and that I'll pose to you, is where do we, as biomedic designers, fit in? We want to research and study nature in order to learn from it. And research takes time. Sometimes biomedic solutions require not just looking at the form of nature, but diving deep into the processes and the mechanics that allow them to be possible. 
Now, I can't tell you the exact answer to this because there's a lot of design firms, they don't really care so much about this. They just care about a steady output of products in order to ensure profit. But I want to tell you about a personal example that I'm going through right now as a biomimicry PhD student at the University of Akron. In a collaboration between biomimicry fellows, industrial design students at the Cleveland Institute of Art, and Nottingham Spurk, the business innovation and product design firm in Cleveland, we're tackling interdisciplinary communication, an essential skill in biomimicry, head on. You see, when you bring so many people of so many disciplines together in the same room, there's a vast knowledge to utilize, but with that diversity come language barriers. There's a unique translation that has to occur from the language that biologists use to describe the biological systems that they're researching to the language that designers and engineers need in order to develop designs that we can ultimately manufacture. The way that we are approaching this is by breaking down and abstracting these adaptations into the basic forms and mechanisms that make them possible. An example of this is the gecko example I gave you earlier. I use the analogy of human hairs in an attempt that the transfer of that language would put it into terms that those who aren't so well versed in bio, biology lingo could be, have a better understanding of what I was talking about. So I believe that it's this formation of multilingual design firms that will really allow biomimetic solutions to flourish. And that way, designers learn more about biology and biologists learn more about design. Now, you may be expecting somewhere in my talk for me to talk about how great biomimicry is for the economy or how much money companies can save when they implement biomimicry into their workflow. And don't get me wrong, biomimicry definitely, definitely does those things. When companies use biomimetic solutions, they tend to be more energy and material efficient, meaning that there's going to be a margin of profit that comes along with that. But I'm also not here to talk to you as a businessman. I'm here to you tonight as a designer. And designers, most of us, we don't really care about things like that. What designers care about are creating things that are new and exciting, things that could save the world or change it in unique and creative ways. And in the end, isn't that kind of what we all want? Biomimicry will allow us to do this by changing the way we design and manufacture the things and the places that we interact with every day. It will open up a whole new world of inspiration for designers. Now, I've always been the kind of person that had no idea what I wanted to do with my life because I'm interested in so many different things, whether it's biology or art and design or computers and science. What biomimicry has allowed me to do is it's given me the choice not to choose. It's, been, it's given me the opportunity to dive deeper into the knowledge of all the disciplines I'm interested in and has opened my mind as a designer to all the possibilities. Because people, they sit at their desk all day long, pulling out their hair, trying to think of the next big solution to world problems, when sometimes the best thing to do is just look at the world itself for your inspiration. Thank you.